As for Calarho, Eunux took charge of her and brought her to the queen without any advance warning. When the king sends, no announcement is made. Seeing her so suddenly, Tatira jumped up from her couch. She thought it was an apparition of Aphrodite to whom she was especially devoted. But Calarho made an, obs an obeisance. The eunuch perceived Tatira's astonishment. This is Calarho, he said. The king has sent her for you to look after until the trial. Tatira was delighted to hear this. She set aside all the jealousy a woman might feel, and her goodwill towards Calarho was increased by honor done to her. She was proud to have Calarho entrusted to her. She took her by the hand and said, Don't cry, my dear. You have nothing to worry about. The king is a good man. You will have the husband you want. You will celebrate your wedding with greater honor after the judgment. Go and rest now. I can see that you are worn out and still distressed. Her words were welcome to Calarho, who was longing for peace and quiet. When she had laid down, and they had left her to herself to rest, she touched her eyes. Have you really seen Charius? she said. Was that my Charius, or is that too an illusion? Perhaps Mithridates called up a spirit for the trial. They say there are magicians in Persia but he actually spoke. Everything he said showed he knew the situation. Then how he could not bear to, then how could he bear not to embrace me? We parted without even a kiss. As she was continuing with herself in this fashion, the sound of footsteps could be heard, and the loud cries of women. They were all hurrying to the queen thinking it a splendid opportunity to see Calarho. But Tatira said, We should let her be. She is indisposed. We have four days to see her, and to listen to her, and to talk to her as well. They left sadly, and came early the next day, and they eagerly reported the process every day. The palace filled up with people, the king, too, visited the women more frequently, ostensibly to see Tatira. Expensive gifts were sent to Calarho. She refused all of them and maintained her appearance of a woman oppressed by misfortune, sitting there dressed in black and unadorned. But that only made her look more striking. When the queen asked her which man she wanted as her husband, she made no answer and burst into tears. This, then, was Calarho's situation. As for Dionysius, he tried to endure what was happening to him in a spirit of nobility, drawing on his natural stability of character and his disciplined good breeding. But the unbelievable disaster that had befallen him might have driven even the bravest man out of his mind, for he was more ardently in love than he had been in Miletus. When his passion first began, it was just her beauty he was in love with. But by now, much else was contributing to that love. Familiarity, the blessing of children, her lack of gratitude, his jealousy, and above all, everything, the unexpectedness of it all.